Well, I hope you're all ready for the second round now. <laughs> I'm not too tired. I think we've been having problems with the, with the slides a bit. That they're very hard to read, but, um, well, I think there's nothing, nothing we can do about that. I think that the title is very straightforward, so it's about the seductive power of, um, of brain images. And I think we all agree, like when you look at them, it's, it's fascinating to look inside somebody's head and even more fascinating to look inside your own head. So usually when we, um, when we have patients or healthy volunteers over for brain scans, uh, the first thing they ask for when they get out of the scanner is, oh, can I have a look at my brain? And it's, why is that? I mean, a, obviously there's this technical thrill to it, you know, that you can look inside the, the hat, which you normally wouldn't be able to do. But I think it's also the fascination of something as complex as a brain um, and the knowledge about what it does, um, that you can see it. And we're such visual creatures, the second we see something, it becomes so much more believable. And I would like to use the next hour um, and start with a caveat about that. Um, so as, as thrilling as that might be, and um, as much as it can help us to convey information, I think we also have to be very aware of um, the seductive power of it. So when it makes us believe something that is actually not there and that we have to be very careful with the information and the way we digest them when they are compared, when they are paired with imaging. Um, but I would like to use most of the time to showcast examples where I think Imaging taught me something about pain. And this is a very um, personal selection. You might agree to one or two of the, I think four or five I'm going to show you, uh, and not to others. But I, I think these four or five cases I'm going to show you so studies or topics. Um, in these topics, the imaging has helped us to really reveal something about pain and learn something about pain we wouldn't know otherwise. So what do I mean when I talk about the, the fascination of these pictures. You see them all the time, so you can hardly open or go in a library uh, on biology or neuroscience without seeing something like that. And these pictures sell so easily, you know. They're usually very colorful. Uh, if you're lucky, they also come with a dynamic component, so you can see a little film. And it's, it is fascinating, it's absolutely captivating, as, because as I said, we want to learn about ourselves and we want to understand that black box, which is the brain, okay? Um, but I would like to show you one example. Don't try to read that. I'm not going to read that out to you. It doesn't matter what it says. But it was a study done by um, Dina Weisberg uh, at the Yale University on the seductive allure of neuroscience explanations. And what she did was she tried to explain different phenomena by giving these uh, participants information, different types of information. And the ones you can see on the left were scientifically proven or reasonable explanations. So they did make sense in that particular context. And on the right, here are um, examples for explana explanations which are actually not, which don't hold. So they don't make sense scientifically. And these two, she paired in one case with the sentence, or started the sentences with researchers claim, and then came the claim. And in the other conditions, she paired it with brain scans indicate, and some sort of blurb on which areas in the brain might be involved in that. It's, it was completely random, so it wasn't uh, actually factual. But she wanted to know whether adding the statement about the brain and that the brain scans showed something would increase the believability or the satisfaction of the explanation. And I think it's a very interesting study. I will show you the results. That is what she saw. She studied three different groups. One group was, were the novices, so they didn't have anything to do with science. They were like proper lay people. Um, so you would find on the streets so if you just grab somebody and say, do you want to take part in this study? The other ones were students, so they had a, um, a basic level of uh, education in scientific thinking. And the others were experts. And you can see the left columns, left two columns, are always the good explanations, so the, the scientific explanations. The right ones to the right are the bad explanations, so ones that didn't make sense at all. And then you can see in the dark orange, coded, 
the, the evidence uh, without neuroscience, so without this brain in scan, scans indicate, and in pale yellow, the ones that were combined with the, um, with the link to brain imaging. And I find these, these results absolutely fascinating. So when we look at the novices, they usually buy into that. So everything above zero, which mean, me, means it's, it's satisfying the explanation. And you can see that even if something is a bad explanation, you know, they would still buy it if it's combined with imaging. Okay, so if you say brain scans indicate, they would still find it believable. Okay. Um, this year is interesting. The students find that more convincing when the good uh, explanations are combined with neuroscience. And the experts <laughs> don't believe it at all unless it's really a good explanation and it doesn't necessarily have to combine with neuroscience so it doesn't it, it, it reversed actually so it was even worse when you combine that with uh, brain imaging so that I find very very interesting which it, because it means that if even if you don't have a good explanation or you're completely making it up people tend to believe you if you add to that that it was proven with brain scans and that is ex exactly the the uh, problem that comes with it, or the caution I would like to add to this type of evidence, because not everything that has been studied in a brain scanner and not every colorful blob you see is something that tells you something about the brain or is actually reasonable evidence. So we should have that in mind. But having said that, I want to move on to the examples where I think brain imaging has helped us in understanding pain. And I should probably start with the work um, Vanya has done. So I'm not going to talk about that because he's here, <laughs> so <laughs> that would be silly. But I would like to mention that that has completely changed the way we look at pain and the transition of pain from an acute state to a chronic state and the emphasis that comes um, with chronic pain on the emotional system and cognitive system. I think that has, a huge, has been a huge paradigm, a shift in paradigm, because uh, up to then we thought that it would, we, would, we were still looking at the, um, uh, at, the, at the features or parts of the brain that would process uh, nociception, basically. And I think that that has, been, that has transformed um, the way we look at, at chronic pain. So, but I'm not going to talk about that. Let me give you the first example uh, I found absolutely fascinating. And that was back when I was still in Germany. I started working with phantom limb pain patients. And I'm pretty sure who of you sees phantom limb pain patients? You just show up? Anybody? Oh, not many. Okay. So this is a, a very, very interesting group of patients because um, in these patients, the bit that hurts is no longer there. So these, this group of patients has struggled for a very, very long time with. Um, ignorance and with people not believing them that they are in pain. So before, I think, I think that is fair to say that before people started looking at the brain of these patients, um, they always had to fight against the accusation that they were making it up, that there was something wrong with them, that they were fantasizing. Uh, and I think brain imaging did a huge help these patients a lot to show that the brain is involved in their pain. And even though the part of the body that hurts doesn't exist anymore, it's still represented in the brain. And without going into details, I just want to mention um, the groundbreaking work of um, Niels Bierbaumer and Hertha Flohr by that time. So they did it in the mid-90s. Um, 1990s, I have to say, um, on reorganization. So you might have heard about that, that the, the surface of the body is represented in the primary somatosensory cortex in, a, in an organized fashion. So we call that the homunculus. You might have heard about that. Uh, and what it, what it basically shows is um, a representation of body parts which are highly sensitive. So for instance, your lips and your fingers they would be large, they have a large representational area in S1, whereas others are rather small. So you can see uh, trunk and shoulder are uh, definitely less sensitive, so they occupy less space in S1. And their question was, when I started out working with phantom limb patients, to, um, to answer the question, what happens to this part of the body uh, that becomes empty when, let's say, the hand or the, the whole arm gets amputated. So what is happening to this bit that is becoming silent, or that, that was one of the questions, whether it would be silent, uh, and how is that related to the sensation of phantom limb pain? 
And what they showed was very much an invasion of um, the adjacent lip area. So this lip area, that was the idea by that time. We've moved on, I think, um, from there. I would show that in a second. But that the representation of the lip would start op occupying and creeping into this old representation of the hand and occupy this space. And uh, by that time, was a, they found a huge correlation between um, this uh, phantom, phantom limb pain and this reorganization in S1. I think apart from the scientific value of it, it gave huge credit to um, the patients and the reports of these patients that there was something going on in their brain that could potentially explain the pain. As I said, I mean, it's not that straightforward, so we know now that there are other groups of patients who suffer from uh, that reorganization, and it's not necessarily tightly linked to um, pain. So you can see here neuropathic pain, these neuropathic orofacial pain patients. It's a study by Sylvia Gustin done in Australia. Um, they show this reorganization, so you see a misplacement, a, dis um, a, a move of this, um, a shift in this representation um, uh, of the body parts in their S1, in their primary somatosensory cortex, but you don't see it in nociceptive orofacial pain. So it's not specific for phantom pain. We see it in, other, in some other pain syndromes too, but not in all of them. And Quite recently, if you want to check that out, I think it's a, um, that's the latest addition to that debate. It's done by a dear colleague of mine, oh, you can't read it. It's done uh, by Tama Makin uh, in Oxford. She looked exactly at this uh, link between phantom pain and reorganization and found that the reorganization is mainly driven by preserved input of the hand. So the debate around this has moved on, but I think the value and the, the, um, the chance it gave these patients to show that it's more than just a report of something that doesn't exist, but there's really something to it that was enormous. Let's move on to the second example, and I think, again, this is one of these milestone papers uh, that I think came out last year uh, by Tor Vegas group on the neurological signature of physical pain. So what this group was trying to do was that they, they took a lot of data sets in different conditions. I'm not going to go into details, but they were trying to um, dissect what of all these activations we usually see when we inflict pain um, on somebody who is lying in a scanner, what is actually specific for pain? And there's been a huge debate around that. I don't know if you've followed that debate. There is um, there's this notion that what we see is more related to salience rather than pain. That is a, a discussion that was stirred up by um, Gian Domenico Iannetti, who is in London now, and André Moreau from Leuven. Um, there is another discussion around that that was almost violent when we went to um, Buenos Aires now. Very interesting discussion about whether you can capture the neural signature of something as complex as pain with brain imaging. And people who put forward the criticism uh, came from the psychological end of the spectrum of professions working on pain. And their criticism is basically that the pain is so complex and so individual that you can't possibly see everything that makes pain pain in a scanner. So there will always be a social element to pain. There will always be something complex in the, um, in the interaction with other people, in my understanding of pain, that you would never find in a scanner or in the brain. <laughs> right. To be honest, I don't necessarily agree to it. I think it's a, it was a fair criticism because I think for a long time the way we've looked at pain was rather mechanistic and simplistic. Um, but I think the pain community and the pain imaging community has opened up to pain as a very complex experience. Um, and so there are these two camps out there. One says it will never, you will never be able to capture pain even with the best of technolo technological advances. And there's the other camp that says, in principle it is, we are not there yet, technically, okay? You can work out for you where you sit in uh, between these two extreme positions. But I think the interesting bit in this particular study was that they used a method uh, that is based on this idea, and it's called decoding and uses a multivariate pattern analysis. So what we do in decoding or multivariate pattern analysis 
is very different to what we usually do. What we would normally do in a brain imaging study is that we would uh, use, for instance, different types of um, heat levels to inflict pain or induce the sensation um, that is non-painful. And then we would check how that is translated into the brain. So we would look what, at the difference between these two states. With multivariate pattern analysis, the approach is completely different. It's right the opposite. So you would want to look at brain images and try to infer from looking at these pictures whether somebody has been in pain or not. Okay? So it's exactly the opposite approach. And everybody who's roughly familiar with the idea knows that this type of approach has been used in other, in other circumstances, in other conditions. And what comes to mind is mind reading, brain reading. So can we read out from the brain whether somebody was lying, for instance? Or in the context of pain, can we stick somebody in a scanner and work out from that if somebody is really in pain and deserves, for instance, the financial compensation they've claimed? And you can see already from here that this is highly political. Yeah? So if you would, if, let's say you have a patient in mind where you have doubts that that particular patient experiences as much pain as he or she claims to suffer from. Sometimes I think there is this desire to just stick somebody into a machine and work that out, you know, if, if that's really true. But obviously, if you're familiar with the statistics behind brain imaging, you understand that what we usually do are group studies. So we're talking about a statistical mean we usually look at. We rarely ever look at individual pictures, yeah? pictures of one single person. And we do that for good reason. We do that because they are highly noisy. So there's a lot of information in that signal that is probably not related to pain at all. But I think it's out there now, the idea to apply this type of approach to pain and work out if somebody is in pain. And I will give you a brief overview on where we are with that. That's the basic type of analysis you do. So you take a data set, let's say from um, 100 subjects, so you've scanned 100 subjects in pain and with a non-painful stimulation, and you would divide your data set up in 99 of these orange blocks, so 99 subjects, if that was a cross-subject. Let's start with a within-subject. So let's say you have 100 trials, so you've poked this particular person 100 times. You would take 99 of these trials and train a computer on that pattern that is, means pain for this particular person, okay? So the computer should learn to differentiate between the brain when the person is in pain and the brain when the person is not in pain, okay? And you do that with all possible combinations. So here you would leave the second trial out and train your computer algorithm on the, other, on the remaining 99 and then try to apply what the computer has learned on the last trial, which you haven't included, okay? So that's why it is called machine learning, because the machine learns to tell the two states apart, okay? And what you can do with that is, A, you can try to discriminate between different patterns. So what does the brain pattern look like when somebody is in pain versus when they are not in pain? And what comes in handy here is that this type of method doesn't treat each and every tiny little part of the brain, so these voxels, independently, but it's really looking at the overall picture of that. So if you want, to, if, if you want the, the color coding of that brain in that particular state, okay? And what you could also do is you could look at the localization of this information. So you would want to know which part of the brain, if I would only want to look at very few parts of the brain, could tell me whether that person is in pain or not. Which is interesting because it goes a bit against the idea of a network, right? So the network, as we've learned in that last uh, talk, is very much about the, the integration of information at the shared contribution to something we call pain. So the localization is definitely nothing that gives you 
P1, so the pain area in the brain, but it will always be a sort of a network of areas. But in principle, you can localize this information. And we did that in a study um, we published in, um, in, general, in Journal of Neuroscience with a so-called near threshold paradigm. And the idea of this paradigm is very, very, very simple. So what you try to find with, in this case, laser stimuli, is you try to find the intensity that is ever so slightly painful. So that is just crossing this pain detection threshold. So everything below this line in intensity would be non-painful, and everything above it that you would call painful. And I think the beauty of this paradigm, we didn't, we didn't develop it, by the way, we nicked it, but um, um, the, the idea of this paradigm is to apply physically identical stimuli that have been calibrated to exactly this turning point and check which of the stimuli go above this line and which go below this line, okay? So why would they go below this line and above this line? Well, I mean, everything fluctuates when you're just lying in a scanner getting these laser stimuli. Sometimes you attend to them, sometimes you get a bit distracted, sometimes you amplify your pain processing, sometimes you don't on a spontaneous level. But the nice thing is that physically, these stimuli are always identical, okay? And then later on, you would group all the ones, all these stimuli, that were classified and perceived as painful in one group, and the other ones that were perceived as non-painful go into the other group. And you can then work out what's the difference between the two. So we did that, and we did that for two phases. So the first, and that was interesting, is the anticipation phase. So our poor subjects were lying in a scanner and they were waiting for these um, laser stimuli. And they knew when they would come because they got a cue beforehand, okay? And our question was whether we can work out from brain activity during this waiting period whether the stimuli would then later on be perceived as painful or as non-painful. And indeed, if we teach this classifier, so this, this computer, to work out what the brain looks like when people were in pain and when they were not in pain, it can tell it apart above chance. You can see it's not highly above chance, so chance would be 50%, and we're just a little bit above that, yeah. And that was clearly disappointing. We had hoped for something like 80% or 90%, but with 58%, you can work that out, and that was statistically significant. The chances are much higher, or not much higher, but higher when uh, we look at the stimulation period, so that is this uh, time here when the actual stimulus was applied. So again, the question was, can we tell just by looking at the brain images whether these people perceived the stimulation as painful versus non-painful? And you can, and you can see the localization here. These were the usual suspects. It wasn't that much about, much about localization. But definitely, I want to see the person who feels confident in saying in a single case that somebody is in pain or not when you can tease the two apart or tell the two apart with 58% or 61% probability. That is high risk, okay? So accusing somebody of malingering, so of pretending he's in pain, when we don't clearly understand what is going on there yet is highly critical and I think so that paper came out before Tor Vegas' paper, and things have moved on from there. I just wanted to go a little bit more into the methods here. So I think we're learning more and more, and Tor's paper has shown that we can advance this, this technology, and we can get closer to the neuros, uh, neurological signature, neurosignature, I would call it, and we can, we can differentiate that, the brain in physical pain, from, for instance, social pain, which is always or very often mixed together. So people would say, if you feel isolated, that's the same as physical pain. That's clearly not the case when you look at the brain. You, know, you can tell the two apart. But I think this development and this analysis has helped us a lot to understand what is specific for pain and what is probably something that comes with it that would also come with other sensations. Another development um, that is quite important in that 
domain is uh, the classification not only within subjects but across subjects. So ultimately, I don't want to understand in very detail how you process pain in 20 years' time or 30 years' time. It's, it's not about the individual in this case, but I would ideally train a norm data set so that I would understand what pain usually looks like in lots of people and then apply it to another person that hasn't contributed to this um, training set. And of course, herein lies the difficulty because as we know, pain is very, very different between individuals. So will this norm data set ever capture what the pain experience is for an individual person? We don't know. I think it's, uh, it's very much a matter of time to get to that point, but the question is, will it be, will it be possible? Will, is it feasible in principle? So the idea of within subject classification <clears throat> is like that. So you train a data set in one particular subject and then apply what the computer has learned to an independent data point of the same subject Whereas in a cross-subject classification, you learn and uh, uh, you teach the algorithm across subjects and then apply it to a sixth new subject. And people have done that. That is a group <clears throat> that has published in 2011 this paper with a cross-subject classification. And it turned out that these two regions were the most, um, the most important ones. So that could tell us uh, most reliably whether somebody was in pain or not. Um, again, I'm not going to go into details. We will hear in the next talk more about mechanisms, so I'm not going to go into that. Example number three, and that's probably one of the most prominent examples um, in brain imaging, I think, and particularly when it comes to modulation, that's placebo analgesia. So the fact that you can develop a full-blown, proper analgesia based on the belief that you got a powerful painkiller, even though it was just a sugar pill. And we've briefly touched, touched on that already, so I just want to add um, two, I think, very interesting findings. One is that the modulation can go down to the spinal dorsal horn, so that is the study. Um, a fantastic a colleague of mine did, Falk Eipert, who is in Oxford now, uh, and he showed that what is happening in the brain gets transported down to the spinal cord, so it does affect it as well. To what an extent that is causal, we don't know, uh, but you can see that it has repercussions also on the spinal level. And another, um, I think, very interesting observation is that placebo responses seem to be, to, at least to some extent, um, related to the structure or structural integrity of the fibers involved. So fractional anisotropy is a reflection of fiber integrity of um, the white matter. So to what an extent these fibers are really intact. And you can see that these uh, regions, which are classically involved in placebo responses, the rostral ACC and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, um, have to have this fiber integrity uh, for the placebo response to emerge. So um, the fiber integrity scales with the individual placebo response. I think that is another way of looking or of another way of integrating information about structure and function, which is, I think, one of the uh, big trends in, in imaging now, not to only use one modality and one way of looking at the brain, but to, do, um, to use a multimodal approach and combine different types of information. It's still a bit limited because it's, it's quite hard um, to find the common sort of um, uh, analysis pathway for these, different uh, for, for these different types of analysis, but ultimately that's what it will, about, will be about. So you would want to understand uh, to what an extent the function and limitations in function are driven, for instance, by problems people have on the structural level. And then obviously you would always want to combine that with uh, behavioral data. Example number four. El ejemplo número cuatro. Y esta es básicamente mi zona de estudio, de investigación, es la influencia de los procesos cognitivos de nivel superior. Y esto es un dominio en el que se puede, no podemos sustituir el conocimiento que tenemos de la neuroimaginería porque es muy difícil, muy difícil a pre preguntar a alguien. This is quite an old study, but I dig that out because I thought that would illustrate quite well what I mean with higher level cognitive function. So that is a study I did when I was still in London, and it was very much motivated by the observations in patients. What these patients very often told me, and I worked with phantom limb pain patients by that time, um, 
what I told me was, it's not so much the pain that is so unbearable, it's that I can't control it. So if I want to go somewhere, I don't know if I have to go back straight away simply because I get one of these massive pain attacks where I can't sit, where I can't stand, where I can't lie. I'm just vegetating somewhere. And the fact that they didn't have anything at hand that helped them with the pain made the pain worse. And I thought that as a psychologist, my background is in psychology, I, I was very interested and fascinated by, by this observation and I thought I would want to understand what this is. And not so much what it is that makes the pain worse, but what it is that makes the pain better when you think you can control it. And let's just take a second to relate that to the patients you see. I think this particular psychological dimension varies a lot between individuals. Uh, the desire to control pain and also the idea that they have control over their own pain. So I think that was part of, your, of the question you asked. Yeah? So people come but they have a very passive understanding of um, what is going on inside their body and what they can do about it. And the question was how do we change that? Let's go back one step and look at how important that really is and, and for whom it is more important uh, and is it more important for some than for others. So what I did in this study was I had three conditions. In all three conditions, these healthy volunteers got the same electrical stimulation which was painful and it was repetitive. So they got zap after zap after zap after zap. In the self conditions, and the condition I call self here, they could stop the stimulation at any time. So they would just press a button and that would stop the stimulation immediately. Okay. In the second condition, which we call other, I told them, listen, there's nothing you can do. You will be in the scanner and there will be a second person sitting outside and he or she will stop the stimulation whenever they want. Okay, so if they don't want it to stop, it will go on. Okay. And in the third condition, I told them, there's nothing you can do. This, the computer or the simulation will follow a random sequence that will be stopped by the computer at some point. And there was an interesting difference, I'm not going to go into detail here, but there was an interesting difference between these two. In both conditions, people didn't have any control over the pain. But in the other condition, they thought it was a person controlling it. So there was some intention behind that. Whereas in the computer condition, it was just by chance, you know, it would just stop by chance. And I didn't, I didn't expect that to be such a, make such a big difference, but I did a I did a pilot study before I um, did it as a, as a scanning study, as an imaging study. And in the pilot study, I included men and women. And we had a massive uh, sex difference between men and women with respect to tolerating the loss of control. Okay, here's the question. <laughs> Who do you think? <laughs> Okay, I think I've lost it already. It's so clear, right? So who was struggling more with the loss of control? I want to ask you because I've, <laughs> I've already said it more or less. Were the men? It was incredible. When I told them there is no other person, that was an experimental manipulation, they wouldn't believe it and they would go, I want to see that guy. Yeah. And I said, there is no other guy. <laughs> so that is, it was just an experimental manipulation. But it went up to the point that I said, I, can, I can't do that in the scanner with this type of aggression. So we did the study with women only in the scanner. So that was, I, I didn't believe in gender differences by that time, but that taught me a lesson, taught me a lesson. So since then, I do believe in it. Anyway, so when we compare the self-controlled pain and the externally controlled pain, collapsed across these two, do you think that made a difference in the way people perceived pain? Simply knowing that I can press a button at any time and that would stop the stimulation, although in all three conditions they got exactly the same number of stimuli. So physical, physically it wasn't different at all, it was just the cognitive set. And it makes a difference. It's not huge, 
But you can see there is a difference, and A, in pain intensity, and even more in anxiety. So people definitely, even though they had the same nociceptive input, felt less anxious and felt less pain when they knew they could stop it at any time. And as I said, I was mainly interested in the resources they tap into when they think they can control the pain. I wasn't so much interested in the flip side, so in the, in the uh, aggravation of pain. What is helping them? These are very interesting regions. Um, so one was the DACC, and the other two were prefrontal areas we know are involved in top-down modulation. So anything that helps you in coping with pain would engage these regions. We do see them in placebo analgesia. I saw them in the modulation of pain through religious belief and even higher, higher level cognitive belief. So the idea that somebody, a higher entity, and in this case it was God because we looked at Roman Catholics, would help you in coping with pain, would always bring up these areas. So they are not specific for perceived control, but they are part of a top-down network that dampens down the pain, probably even only on the prefrontal level, so not, probably not um, going down to the spinal level. But the interesting thing was, oh, we can skip that. The interesting thing was that, how is that region and the activation in this region related to the overall belief in control? We gave people a questionnaire that asked, do you think you can usually control things in life? So when you do something, do you think that has direct repercussions if you find your circumstances to be miserable and you try to change them? Does it really change your conditions? Does it really change your circumstances? And people vary a lot. So some people would say, you know, no matter what I do, my life is always a disaster. And some people would say, if I, try, if I really try to change things, it does make a difference, okay? So, the higher you score on that questionnaire, the more you think you can control things in life, which culturally speaking, we very much promote. So when you think about your therapy and anything basically you encounter, it's very much about being active, ideally being proactive, so contributing and having not that passive attitude, but a very hands-on attitude that I can do things in life. This is an example of where it can turn against you. So we look at this, as long as the pain is self-controlled, this region that helps you in coping with pain, the ALPFC, doesn't, or activation in this region, doesn't scale with control belief, okay? So it's, that is a flat line, there's no correlation. But look at that, when the pain becomes uncontrollable, these people who score very high on the control questionnaire don't engage that region that helps you in coping with pain. It's a hard one, isn't it? <laughs> so, I would do it again, I always, I always find it difficult to get my head around it. So, when the pain becomes uncontrollable, people who usually think they can control things in life, so who score high on that questionnaire, can't seem to activate this region that helps them in coping with pain. That is very counterintuitive to start with, but what that means is this thriving for control, this need to have control over something, that is actually probably outside of the scope of our control, at least in that partic particular moment. That drive and this need to get things under control might turn against us in that particular case. It's just one of study, we certainly have to follow up on that. But it, is, it was very much in line with clinics, clinical observations we had with people who are high achievers, who are usually the ones who get each and every pro problem under control until they've started facing chronic pain and couldn't do anything about it. Let's see, now that isn't working. Here we go. Okay, I just want to finish my presentation with how do we use that knowledge in daily practice? Because again, you could say, these are nice studies, and particularly the last one, it was a one-off, so does that really hold, and how do I translate that into daily practice? 
I hope that I've convinced you that new imaging and these, particularly these pictures and being able to see what is going on and understanding the mechanisms we will hear about in the next talk, um, that is something very valuable. How do we put that into what we do when we see the next patient? Okay. I think the first bit is the explain pain. It's not the book. You, you probably know the book, and I think it's really brilliant because I don't get anything from that. I'm not involved in that book. But I think it is, it's a great example of how we can translate what has been found um, and the scientific evidence into something each and everybody can understand and can relate to. You might not want to use this particular book. I think there are others out there. But I think the key part is um, to bring across a, a, a proper biopsychosocial model. So that, is, that departs from this biological model alone, but integrates evidence from different disciplines on chronic pain. And that might be difficult. I spoke to somebody uh, yesterday, and she said that it's incredibly difficult when patients come with a very strong biological model. Uh, plus, on top of that, if your colleagues support a biological model only, to go against that and, and, and swim against that tide and emphasize it's not just about that. Plus, your patients don't necessarily love you for the message that um, psychology is involved. That's a, it's a really difficult one. Uh, it, and they usually what they hear is your, your pain is in your head, okay? And they're not happy with that. What we say is, yeah, pain is in your head, but it's in everybody's head, you know? It's not just in your head. Pain comes from your head. It wouldn't exist otherwise, and it's necessary. Just, it's just in that particular case, something has been amplified, which is exactly down to these mechanisms that, are, that come down to the pain and the pain in the brain. So I think finding a good model you can work with and adjusting the model to the level a patient can relate to is critical. That doesn't mean that you have to bring across that you come with these studies. You know? I remember I went to a physio clinic once and <clears throat> the patient came in and the highly motivated physio who had read about all these different studies and all the different evidence that is out there uh, said, hello, today we're going to rewire your brain. And you think, no, you know, that is, the patient was scared. And I think that is, that is not the best of examples. It's treating with the knowledge of that in mind. So you have that background and you have that understanding, but packaging it in a way that the patient can relate to it is a second, is a second thing, and that's, and that's crucial, okay? And ultimately, you know, when it comes to the stories um, people talk about, uh, like we are going to rewire your brain. I think if we want to make inferences about the role of um, the brain in pain, then we ultimately um, we have to look at the brain. So you can't infer just from behavior uh, and any clinical observations. Um, we, can't, we can't make any inferences on what is happening in the brain. I think that is very, very critical. So when you talk to patients and you want to teach them about the role of the brain in pain, it's absolutely essential to simplify but not, not to oversimplify and overgeneralize. A clear part of pain perception, we've heard that, is in the brain. That is critical. But it's certainly not all about the brain. There are other aspects, and they want to be heard, and they want to be communicated. And last but not least, I think you and your role as physiotherapists are in a key position, because what you work with is the body. And that is something probably nobody else does to the extent you do it. So you, you have the privilege of being able to touch people, to relate to something that is as physical as the body. And I think nothing is as instructive as touching and working with the body. And if I've lost you, now let me give you an example before everybody falls asleep. Let me give you an example. Just making that up. So I watched, my son is taking swimming lessons, okay? And he's learning to crawl like this this one, which is really difficult. So you have to, you have to coordinate leg movement and this. Hmm. So I saw him through the glass wall with his instructor. And it's a fantastic lady. She's a Polish lady, very hands-on. So she showed him this movement. And God knows what he was doing, but it was certainly not that. <laughs> so he was doing something else, which is hard to watch, you know, because you think, goodness, why, what is so difficult about it? 
But this lady was brilliant. So at some point, you know, after she had explained it to him 10 times, and she was standing outside the pool, he was in the pool, she said, yeah. So he had to climb out of the pool. And what she did was, because what he wasn't getting, that he had to turn his head when he was breathing. What did she do? She took his face and turned it so that he could feel what it feels like. And you could see him, his face lighting up. Like, that's what it feels like. Right, all these words didn't bring across what she could do with touching him and showing him how to move his head in which direction at what particular point in time. And I know this analogy is limping on all, <laughs> in all dimensions here. What I'm just trying to say is, I think you're very privileged in what you can do because you, you are working with something everybody can relate to, it's very direct, and it brings across all the different dimensions we've been talking about. Beliefs, expectations, everything is reflected in the way they treat their body, they hold their body, and they engage with their body. So I think this is, I think, a great, um, a great quote, and what you can do is just use it. Thank you.